So we're continuing our study through the book of 1 John. We talk a lot about love, right? Christian, we talk a lot about love. And it's the topic that Christians talk a lot about. And it's interesting to note that though we talk a lot about it, it's also one of the topics that I have to do the most counseling on, it seems like, right? And you would think that with all of the talking about love that we do on a regular basis, we've got t-shirts about love, we've got teachings about love, we've got bumper stickers about love, it still seems to be that it is one of the most difficult topics for us to truly understand, and not just to understand, but really to apply to our lives. Um, Tina Turner once said, What's love got to do with it, right? You guys have heard the song. And what I find to be interesting is though we talk a lot about it, it's sometimes almost, it's separated, if you will, from how we really live out our Christian walks, right? My early ideas of Christianity were not favorable, okay? To put it bluntly, I thought the people were fake, the men were too soft, the women were too pushy, the music was too lame, the church was too political and money-hungry, and God just did not impress me. In fact, it seemed to me, especially when the church talked about love, that I was the most disgusted by it. Because I felt like, who are these people to tell me about love when so many other religions, so many people that are non-religious in nature, also talk about love, right? Love seems to be a topic that the world seems to talk a lot about, right? We have movies on love. We have a whole genre, in fact, of movies and books that are on romance and love, right? So who is it that the Christian thinks that they are to talk to me about love? What I didn't understand was that God's definition of love is different than humanity's different definition of love, right? The Bible talks differently about love than what most people understand love to be. For me personally, I also had no interest in love. You see, the reason being is because it seemed like love was weakness to me. I always felt like if a guy was really mushy and really loving, like that old area of scripture, if I could be blunt for a moment, where it talks about greet your brother with a holy kiss, like, ew, right? <laughs> no, leave that for, for some other person, okay, that's soft like you, right? I didn't like it. I didn't like talking about love because it seemed like the people in my life that were, I was most connected to, that I loved the most, often caused the most damage to me as well, right? Loving people... Okay, loving God seemed to me like a surefire way to get myself hurt, and I was uninterested in it. I've shared with you guys before my experiences with abuse, and all sorts of abuse from an early, early age. And it was always the people that swore that they loved me, and swore that they would never do anything to hurt me, that seemed most capable. I learned early on, as I became a Christian, that it was also the people who swore that they understood God's love, <coughs> that were also the most capable of hurting me inside the body of Christ, right? Anybody here ever been hurt by another Christian? By the beloved? By the people who understand the love of God? Absolutely. But what does the Bible say about love? What is God's definition of love? You guys are probably familiar with the area of Scripture. Before we get into 1 John, I'm going to ask that you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. First Corinthians chapter 13, starting off in verse 1, says this. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. For a moment, if I can get your attention, for those of you that are familiar with the Pentecostal movement, those of you who are familiar with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the idea of speaking in tongues or speaking in angelic language or speaking a language that you did not know prior Okay, that seems like a pretty impressive thing to do, right? Would you agree? But the Bible says that if you do it without love, it's just noise. In, that, in fact, let us take it a step further. Though you are the most eloquent of preachers and speakers, if you do it without a heart of love, it's just noise. And he goes on. And though I have to give the prophecy, I can speak the oracles of God, right? And understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but not love, I'm nothing. 
In other words, he goes on to say, listen, it doesn't matter how many Bible verses you've memorized. It doesn't matter, Ryan, how smart you think you are concerning the things of God and the Scripture. Listen, if you do this, if you, if you grab a hold of this knowledge, if you will, and do it without a heart of love for God's people and for God, you're nothing. In fact, it doesn't matter how many people tell you you're something. How many people pat you on the back, tell you the greatest preacher that they've ever heard. I get that a lot. <laughs> it doesn't matter because God says without love you're not he goes on and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned but have not love it profits me nothing I don't care how many zeros are on your check towards the end okay not the beginning All right. I don't care about that stuff in fact God doesn't either all right? God says you can sell everything that you've got. You can be the greatest philanthropist to ever live on this planet. You can give more to the poor and to the needy and to the hurting. It does not matter because if you do this without a love for God and a love for his people, it profited you nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. He goes on. Love suffers long and is kind. I love that because we often separate it, right? Love suffers long, right? And then love is kind. But what it says here, note, note with me this, it says love suffers long and is kind, meaning that after you've suffered a long time, you didn't tell the person that you're suffering with them, all right? You didn't, you didn't let them know that you had to suffer on their behalf you know, or for them. No, no, no. You suffered long and you were still kind in the process. And it's, it's totally revolutionary, if you will, if you think about it for a moment, because our expectations of when people show us love, right, is that they're only kind to us and that there's no suffering in the process. But God says, no, 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 understand this, that if you possess love, the kind of love that I have, the kind of love that's only found in me, that's defined by my word, you're going to suffer long and you're still going to be kind in the process. Love does not envy Love does not parade itself around, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, all right? In other words, there's no jerks for Jesus, all right? I know sometimes we like to be those edgy Christians, you know, the ones with the tattoos and the slick back there and stuff like that, but listen, it don't matter, because love is not rude, not rude at all. It continues to suffer and show kindness and show mercy. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. You know, it's not my fault. Pastor Ryan, you don't have my wife. You don't have my husband. If only you did, then you'd understand why it's so hard not to love. If only you had my boss, you would understand. My kids tell me, Dad, it's not my fault. Zion, he hit me first. Judah, he was mean to me first. No, no, no. Listen, love is not provoked. It's not going to be baited into a fight, into an argument, into a bad day. Thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity. And that one's hard. Christian, let me be honest with you for a moment. That one's hard, right? You see that person that's been giving you a hard time for the longest time, that family member that you gave the counsel to, you told them what they should be doing, how they should be raising their kids, how they should be living for the Lord, right? You, you told that coworker, hey, listen, if you really want to see your life transformed and change, and all they do is ridicule you, and all they do is make fun of you, all they do is blow you off, you don't know what you're talking about, and then their life falls apart. And then there's that part of you that goes, I'll pray for you, don't worry. Because I was right. You know what I'm talking about, right? Doesn't think evil. Doesn't rejoice over iniquity. Doesn't rejoice when somebody gets what was coming to them. But rejoices in the truth. Note with me here, it says, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never, ever, never fails. Never fails. Understand this. If love failed, then we are all in some serious trouble. Right? 
Because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? It's the love of God that draws men to If God's love fails, if the love that we read about in the scriptures, not the soft, mushy, fake kind of love that the world knows, but the real kind of love that's demonstrated for us on the cross, if that love fails, if God loses his temper, if God is going to have it out with us, and you know what? No, I'm sorry. The blood of Christ is not enough for your life. You've messed up too many times. Oh, well. If that love fails... Like my love often fails for people, then man, we are in trouble. But if we possess the love of God, bears all things, hopes all things, believes all things, we're never going to fail. He goes on, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now by faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest, the greatest of these is love. Let me get your attention before we move on body of text. That was just the introduction. Mm-hmm. Guys, there's coming a day where we won't just talk about love as we understood it. We won't just talk about love in some metaphorical or metaphysical sense. We're not going to just have this idea of what love is. There's going to come a day where we will realize. I don't think we I don't think I have, if I to be honest with you. I don't understand the depth of God's love yet. But there is coming a day where though I spoke as a child about this topic of love, where I will fully understand the depths, the greatness, the riches of God's love. God's love is amazing. It is power. It is everything. Understand what 1 Corinthians 13 lays out for us. It is a chapter, if you will, given to this topic of love. And it gives us all these definitions of what love looks like and how it's to be enacted. And all these amazing things about love that we look on. And if we're honest, you know what we do? Like, i got no shot at this thing called love. It's a a dream. It's a pipe dream, Pastor Ryan. It's it's not even... This should be categorized in the topic of fantasy because there is no possible way in which I can love the way that God's Word says that I need to love. But understand this, that if we can even get a glimpse of it, even get the smallest understanding of love while we're here in this earth, while we're here in this life, guys, it will transform our relationship both with God and with others. You know, it's an amazing thing to me that Jesus, in summarizing the entire law, did what? What did he say? He says, these are the two greatest commandments, to love God with all of your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul. Love God, and then do what? To love others. Love others. It was said of John, the apostle, that towards the end of his ministry, they would want to have John the apostle. Who wouldn't want to have John the apostle out, right? If we could have John the apostle as our guest speaker, I think we would definitely take that in. In fact, you probably would say, Pastor Ryan, why don't you just sit it out for a little while? John the apostle comes into town. And here John the apostle comes before the people. He had been... He had been um, put on the island of Patmos. He had suffered a great deal of affliction. It said that he was actually, they actually tried to kill him by boiling him alive at one point, and that he survived it somehow, right, by the power of God. And so he would come before the people, and you know what he would say? You'd think he'd have, like, a really long sermon. Maybe not as long as mine, but he would have a good one, right? And what would he say? Love God and love others. And then he would leave, right? Is it would Apostle John, please, I don't mean to be so bold, I don't mean to be so rude here, but can you give us a little bit more? Is there more? Think about it for a moment, Christian. Is there more than that? If we could accomplish those two things in our life, we would have the entirety of God's Word done and figured out, would we not? If we could love God, truly love God with all of our lives and all of who we are, our very being in essence, and love others the way God loved us? Man, that's what we aspire to. Note with me, looking at verse 7 now, 
1 John chapter 4, God tells us to love because it says something about us. Look with me at verse 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. What does love say about us? If you're taking note, number one, it says first that we are his family. Love is the quintessential Christian birthmark, if you will, that is defining who we are. It's the way that the rest of the world recognizes us. It's even the way that God says he also identifies with us. He recognizes us as his children. Because by loving others, by demonstrating this love, it means that we know God, we know his love for us. And that word for know in the Greek is this word gnosko. It means to experience. Perhaps the reason why we struggle with loving others is because we truly do not understand the love of God. Right? We don't know God the way we think we know God. We have an understanding of what we think is the topic of love, but God says, no, 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 it's much deeper, it's much greater than that. By loving others, we show people that we are part of his family. It's interesting to note there's this birthmark that occurs in about, they say, between 70 and 80 percent of Asian people. 70, between 70 and 80 percent of Asian people. It's called the Mongolian Blue Spot Birthmark. The Mongolian blue spot birthmark. The reason why is because as the Huns took over most of Asia, okay, they went into the land and they were raping and pillaging the people, okay, and they were able to pass on this birthmark, this genetic information, onto a majority of the population. So too, as Christians, God has left us with something that the world cannot possibly possess, a true and real and authentic version of love. The world talks about it, they think they understand it, but it's only the children of God who can truly participate in it. Before we are Christ-like, note this, we are the beloved. In fact, in that first verse, it says, Beloved, let us love one another. The translation of the Greek is agapatoi, agapomen. It means the loved, let us love. Catch that, if you will, for a moment, because what he's saying is here, since you've been loved, since you've been shown this great, authentic, real, and perfect kind of love that can only be demonstrated by God himself, since you've been given that love, now it's incumbent upon you to show that love. The beloved, let us love. When done, we show that we're a part of his family. We were at the doctor's office yesterday, we were at um, getting our eyes checked, okay, because we're getting older and I can't see as well. My wife discovered just how blind I am yesterday. We we're comparing, um, I don't know if you guys do this with your spouses, but this is something that we do. We compare how poor our eyesight is with one another, all right? <laughs> Baby, I'm a negative 475. She goes, whoa, that's blind. It's <laughs> like, I know. She's like, I'm only a negative 175. You'll catch up, don't worry. All right? <laughs> and so we're in the doctor's office. She's getting her eyes checked. And there's little Eden. Eden's with us. She came out to the doctor's office with us. And she's in the office with the doctor and Melanie. And Eden, Eden likes to let people know who she is and what she is. It's really important for her. In fact, you can have a little fun with her. You do this. If you call my daughter a girl, she will tell you no. She is not a girl. Okay, this is not something weird. Okay, watch it. You say, Eden, you're a girl. She goes, no. I'm a lady. Yes, very good. Yeah, you, some of you guys have already done this with her. Well, yesterday at the doctor's office, she's telling the doctor, I'm a Borkin. Okay, that's my strange last name, in case you're wondering. I am a Borkin. Okay, and she's letting him know, this is who I am. This is the family that I'm a part of. Understand, believer, we're not just little Christ or Christ-like, but we are also first and foremost the loved. The beloved. Isn't it interesting who's using this very phrase? Wasn't it not John, it tells, tells us in Scripture, that used to rest his head on the chest of the Lord? They called him the beloved disciple. It's fitting that the beloved disciple is letting the rest of the beloved know that it's not a special title. It's all of your titles. You've all been loved by God. You've all been shown the love of God on the cross. So how do we love? You know, 
again, going back to my early views of Christianity and of love, I really didn't understand it. I didn't really understand how this love could truly transform our lives. Until I came across this area of scripture, it was one of the strangest areas of scripture I've ever read. It's Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 15. In fact, turn there. We're going to do some fishing around today in the scriptures. Verse 45, verse 1. Genesis 45, verse 1, it says... Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Now, in case you need the backstory to this, Joseph was now basically the second in command in the Egyptian kingdom, if you will. All right? But that wasn't before he was sold into slavery by his own family, his own brothers. All right, first they wanted to kill him, and then one of them came up with the idea, well, let's not kill him, let's just, you know, sell him into slavery, right? Majority wanted to kill him, by the way, all right? So, so Joseph is sold into slavery. While he's in slavery, he goes through a great many of difficulties and a great many of trials, but all linking back to the very fact that his brothers sold him into slavery, right? Joseph could easily say that all my problems, everything that happened to me in life, it's all your fault. You guys sold me into slavery. You guys did me wrong. And now he's standing before them because there's a great famine in the land and they're in need of help. Did you catch that? Right? They're in need of help. Their family is going to starve to death if Joseph doesn't act benevolently, doesn't help them out in this situation. Okay? Now listen, I'm a family man. I love family. I'm loyal to my family. Okay, but let me tell you, if they wanted to kill me and sell me into slavery and I got put into prison because of them and falsely accused of crimes that I didn't do and spent a long time there because of it, you're hungry, are you? <laughs> I got something for you. Right? How does, how does prison sound? How does death sound? Right? That's what you did to me? Guys, listen, I, maybe, maybe that's not you. Maybe you're a really forgiving and gracious person. Okay, somebody cuts you off on the road, and you're like, praise you, God, thank you. Have a wonderful day, right? But we're not talking about just somebody doing you wrong. We're not talking about somebody ripping you off of a few bucks. We're not talking about somebody robbing you. We're not talking about somebody, this person. These people ruin his life, basically. Years, decades spent in prison, spent in slavery, because they were jealous mean people. So Joseph couldn't restrain himself. He made himself known to his brothers. You know what he said? And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. You know why they're dismayed in his presence, right? Because they realize this guy is going to take us out. All right? We did him wrong, okay? They couldn't even answer him. Their, 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 their mouths are on the floor. You, you catch this, right? Right? You're asking about that? I don't even know what to say to him, right? Goes on. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I'm Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now I feel like this is the part where you would let them know everything that you're going to do to them in light of what they had done to you, right? I'm letting you know that that's me, right? If we don't, I'm not just telling you I'm the same person, I've got the same name as the guy that you put in prison. No, 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 I'm the one that you sold into slavery. But he goes on. But now... Do not, therefore, be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Listen, understand this. The beauty of God's love being demonstrated now. He says, listen, I don't even want you to feel bad about it. I don't even want you to feel bad about it. Listen, somebody does me wrong, and I show them grace and mercy, I still want them to at least feel bad about it. Right? It's like, yeah, I'm going to show you grace, but... You want to go cry for a little bit? That's fine. I'm okay with that. <laughs> he goes on, don't be angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. 
For these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me father, made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord over all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me. You and your children and your children's children, your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty. For there are still five years of famine. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you so that you shall tell my father of all my, glo of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen and shall hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, you want to talk about a holy kiss? Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And after this, his brothers talked with him. And that's, that's not love like I used to think of love, guys. That's strength. The ability to look at the people who have done you wrong and say, listen, I don't want you to feel bad about it because I want you to understand it was all part of God's plan anyways. And everything that you've done to me, God ordained it. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. And not only am I okay with it, listen, I'm here now that I might bless you and minister to you. Man, we get, we get worked up when people hurt us, do we not? We get annoyed when people hurt us. How much better would it be to take the perspective that God gives us here and says it was out of God's love for you and for them that he allowed you, that not only he allowed you, but he put you through those situations that you might be a better minister to your enemies, to those who hurt you. When God says, going back to verse John, but love and let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Understand, when he's talking about this kind of love, he's talking about the love that transforms us from victims into ministers, into people who can take the things that God brought our way and the people that God brought into our lives, even the people who have done this the most wrong, and turn us into ministers towards them. Guys, it was interesting. I, I had a meeting with uh, several pastors and um, local Calvary pastors recently, and uh, we were talking about things that you enjoy most in ministry, right? And everybody's got some of the more cliche Christian answers. You know, we haven't been done it, doing it as long as some of the other more seasoned pastors. And one of the most seasoned pastors there is Pastor Rad from Calvary Chapel, Miami. And so I'm there, and we're talking about, oh, I love seeing when, when people come to know Christ. And I love seeing disciples made. And I love seeing churches planted. And I love seeing missionaries. And Pastor Rad said something so profound that I won't forget it. He says, I love it when people come back. What do you mean when people come back? When the people who have hurt you in ministry, the people who have said the most horrible things about you, the people who have left so angry, come back to the church. I love the opportunity to show them love. When they expect to be rebuked, when they expect to be criticized, when they expect the, oh, it's been a little while since we've seen you here, welcome back, right? When we say, instead of the, I told you so, I love when they come back and I get to love on them. I wonder if Joseph in that moment thought to himself, man, yeah, I wonder at some point if he thought to himself, was he ever going to even see his family? And he realized in that moment, the same thing that he showed to his brothers, listen, God brought me through this great difficulty that I might love on you and minister to you, that I might bless your family and bless your children and your children's children after that. Can you imagine Mark's reaction? You guys know the disciple Mark. Mark was this guy, this young guy who was going on a missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas, okay? And the story tells us that Mark, at one point, gets annoyed, right? Or gets tired. He doesn't want to be out in, um, in the land with, the, with Paul and Barnabas. He doesn't want to be out there doing the missions work, right? And so he just leaves them. 
He says, I'm going back home, right? And, and at some point, he decides, you know what? Actually, I want to do this again. And Paul goes, no. No, you're not coming with us on another mission trip. You messed up the last one. We're good, right? And Barnabas and Paul get into an argument over it. Barnabas is like, no, listen, we got to show God's love. We got to show God's grace. And Paul's like, no way, no how. And they get into such a big dispute over it that they separate. Paul goes one way. Barnabas goes another way. Bye. I thought about this week, Mark's reaction. It says, that the, I think it's in Colossians, I want to say, or Galatians, you can check it for yourself later. It says at one point that Paul calls for Mark. He says, tell Mark that I'm in need of him. Could you imagine Mark's reaction to Paul? Split up, I mean, this, this, this dynamic missionary team, right? Mark's reaction to Paul calling for him. Better yet, Imagine Peter's reaction to the Lord restoring him into ministry. Not just, understand this, not just, hey, listen, I forgive you, but I want you to also now go shepherd my people. Go love my people. The love of God is so profound, and when it's exercised by Christians, it leaves those around us with their mouths on the floor going, I can't believe this. How do you minister to those people? Ryan, how do, you, how do you minister to those family members that abused you for so long? I don't understand it. I don't either. It's the grace and love of God. It's recognizing and remembering that God loved me first. Note this. It says here that God is love, but not only love. And that's important to note because oftentimes this is translated or misinterpreted that God is simply only love. But the Bible also tells us that God is also truth. He's light. He's peace. He's hope. He's righteousness. He's holiness. We cannot be selective in our understanding or interpretation of love. You guys remember the old Burger King slogan? Have it your way? You couldn't have it your way. It was a very dishonest slogan. You know why? You can never go to Burger King and ask for a taco. Right? You can never go to Burger King and ask for a piece of pizza. It wasn't going to happen, right? It was a dishonest slogan. So to understand this, that God's perfect love, what we often understand as God's agape love, is not simply, or shouldn't be simply understood as an unconditional love. Well, oftentimes we think of, well, it's just an unconditional love. It means whatever we do, whatever our standard is, whatever our interpretation is, that's God's love. We don't understand this. God has a perfect love, which means that it is selective, which means that God, when he sees us doing something, just like we would our children, sticking our fingers in an electric socket, he doesn't go, well, you know, it's unconditional, I'll love you anyways. He goes, no, 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 you don't want to do that, right? And he'll put people in our way to stop us, to encourage us, listen, be careful the path that you're going down, right? Because God's love is a perfect love, because it's the love that looks out for his children. He wants to see the church celebrating and walking in this kind of love. A love that wants to see people's lives transformed and changed. It isn't afraid to offend them, even if it means losing them temporarily. You're able to say, hey, listen, understand this. You read in 1 Corinthians, it talks about the excommunication of a member of the church. Excommunication in 1 Corinthians, because this guy was just tearing up the church, it causing all sorts of havoc. Right? At one point, though, it says that he repents, and in 2 Corinthians, Paul encourages him, let him back. When we see even church discipline as an act of love, it means that we understand the love of God. It's not done in retribution to hurt people. It's done that they might be protected because we love them. It's telling a person in love the truth that may cost you your relationship with them. Isn't, aren't you thankful that God tells us the truth even when we don't want to hear it? When God reveals to us those things, and, and Lord, I didn't feel like having a, I didn't feel like having to realize that God will bring us through situations and circumstances to help us realize. Look with me now at verse nine. It says, "In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. And this is love, not that we loved Him, not that we loved God." But that he loved us and sent us his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. 
God's love not only tells us things about ourselves when we act it out, but also it reveals things about his own character. And if you're taking note, number one, it teaches us that God is merciful. God's merciful. I'm not sure I always remember just how merciful God is, right? Sometimes we've been doing this Christianity thing so long that we just almost expect it, right? It's like, yeah, I mean, I know God's merciful, but he's always merciful. He has to be merciful. It's what he does. He's just merciful. Right? Except the Bible gives us a clear understanding in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 9, of just how merciful he is. It says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, the anti God, the people that were against God. In fact, he goes on to say, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. In other words, listen, we all heard stories of people sacrificing their lives, okay, for somebody else. And it's rare. It doesn't happen all the time. Most of the time, people do what? They just walk away. Not my problem. I can't get involved in that right now. i got to work places to be, things to do. You see somebody get in an accident, you're like, well, I'm five minutes late for work. Sorry. You know? And we just move on with our lives. And it says that when that happens, it's usually for somebody that we, we know or we like. You know, if it's our kids or a family member, we'll sacrifice maybe something of ourselves. He, uh, You've even heard family members sacrifice organs. They give up organs so that another family member might live. This is for scarcely. Yet perhaps for a good, I'm sorry, for scarcely for a righteous man, one will die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, some translations say while we were still the enemies of God, Christ died for us. Much more than having not been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. God's love is a merciful love. Yeah. You guys know that I work with strange, exotic animals. I've shared these stories before, all right? And sometimes the way I look, I, I get these cool little pictures from my, from my work experiences. In, in, in the venomous community, Okay, those who work with like cobras, you know, the dangerous stuff, there's something referred to as a dry bite. Okay, you get bit by <coughs> venomous animals, you get a dry bite. Okay, a dry bite means that the animal decided for some reason with that bite that they weren't going to inject you with any venom whatsoever. All right? A very merciful act by an evil animal, if you will, for a moment, right? And you go, wow, man, that's really cool. It is cool, but you know what's interesting? Just because you've experienced a dry bite, you know what you shouldn't do? Presume that every single one afterwards is going to be a dry bite, right? God shows us this great mercy, okay? This act of mercy that isn't to be taken for granted. Paul says, shall we continue to sin that grace might abound? Certainly not. Why? Because when we receive the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, we understand his love for us. And in understanding and knowing God and knowing his love in that moment, it should prompt us to want to be obedient to him. When we see these areas of scriptures like love others because God loved you, it should make us go, you're right. I was the enemy of God at one point, and God showed great mercy. You know what you don't do? You don't mess around with it. Not because you can potentially lose it, because it then shows that you're ungrateful for it. I watched this guy the other day at my work. We had these things called death adders. You guys catch that, right? <laughs> death adders. You know what they cause? Death, death right? And he's, it's a little baby death adder, which actually makes it more dangerous, because they have no control over their venom glands. When they bite, they just secrete <clears throat> everything into you, okay? And I'm watching this guy pick it up by its tail, okay, and play with it. It's unnecessary. I don't know why he's doing this. I have to get my boss. I'm like, listen, we have a crazy person playing with the venomous snakes right now, all right? He must want to find out if it truly causes death or not, okay? <laughs> and so we walk in there and like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, no, I'm just packing it up. I was like, we have hooks. We have things that you could use, cups. I don't know why you're picking it up like that right now. You must not believe what it's known by to cause death. So too, when God is warning us of sin, when God is telling us, listen, love God and love one another and so fulfill all the law. When he's telling us this, he's not simply telling us for our own, for others' benefits, but also for our own, right? God wants us to experience love. God wants us to experience his 
love, and he wants to see the church flourish in this love. So how do we demonstrate his mercy? Well, I mean, we do it to people that we like, right? right? Showing mercy to people we like, that's, that's important, right? In fact, if we're honest, it's easy to show mercy and love to people that we like. It's even easy to show people mercy who we don't know but can pity, right? We feel bad for them. We even empathize for them. We don't have a good relationship with them or anything like that. Listen, Pastor Ryan, I heard you got some missions work that you go, how can I help? I'll write a check. I'll send some support. I don't even know them that well. It's okay. I'll show them some love. But where God's love is truly best put on display is in loving the unlovable. Loving those people in our lives that deserve none of that love. Because we, too, also deserve no love at all. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 36 say this, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. Then who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do you good, do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your war, your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the unthankful and evil. Man, do you catch that? God says, love the people that are the worst to you. Because even God does the same. It says that God's love is so amazing, it's so profound, it's so great, that He loves the unthankful and the evil. You know what the hardest part about loving somebody that's unthankful? Isn't that they expect more, right? Somebody that, that isn't thankful, it's not, that they, it's not only that they expect more, the hardest part about it is that they don't realize what they already have. That's the hardest part, if we're being honest, right? It's like when my kids, uh, and this has happened before, we've experienced this, right? It's Christmas. They just got all their toys. It's like, man, this is pretty awesome. And then they start telling you their Christmas list for next year. It's like, dude! Please, you know, give me a week. <laughs> right? You know. I love that Zion's excited. His birthday's coming up, right? I got three pages. Three pages. Son. I don't know who you think your dad is. Delete, <laughs> delete. Oh. Are we thankful? Do we celebrate the love of God? I've got two dogs. Got a German Shepherd and, and a boxer, okay? And they're both as dumb as a box of rocks, all right? But here's the <laughs> coolest thing about my dogs, right? My dog Titan, okay, he's the German Shepherd. If I say Titan, or if I say he loves this phrase, I don't know why, you want to go get it, his ears immediately perk up. Get what? I'll get anything. I don't even know what I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get it, right? And he gets all excited. He'll run over to the front door, like, what are you gonna go get? He's like, I don't know. We'll see what's out there. Okay? Lily, okay? Lily's the boxer. If I even if, if I even start pronouncing the L, immediately this dog starts convulsing uncontrollably. She's just excited. She doesn't even know why. And then I'll go to touch her, and it's even worse. She's like freaking out now. It's like, this is why I don't touch you. You can't handle this kind of stuff, right? But it's so what does God's love do to us? When he calls our name, when he calls us forth and says, my beloved Ryan. It's like, Ryan, do you want to use me? You love me? What does that do to us? The idea is that it should create in us something that goes, I can't believe I'm a part of this thing. I can't believe I've been included into the family of God. Of all people, Ryan Morgan got included into the family of God. You don't know me. All right, that's why you would smile like, I don't know what Pastor Ryan's talking about, but God knows me. He knows every wicked thought. Every, every evil desire of my heart, all the evil I've inflicted upon others, and yet he still loves me. And note this, number two, he's gracious to the undeserving. There's this uh, speaker, Dave Ramsey, okay, he, uh, he does like a lot of financial talks and stuff like that, and I, I, 
I don't really listen to the financial stuff, I'll be honest with you guys, it's not my forte, but in any case, if you're into it, you'll know Dave Ramsey, and you'll like it, I'm sure. But Dave Ramsey, every time he has a new caller, he says to the caller, he calls him by name, hey, you know, thanks for joining us. And for some reason, the callers always do the same exact thing. They say, hey Dave, how you doing? And he always replies back, with, better than I deserve. Yeah, some of you guys have heard it before. Yes. Better than I deserve, right? It's like, man, that's... <laughs> But that's so vitally important to how we view God's love and how we're able to love one another, right? If we understand that we are in a better place than we deserve to be, then when God calls us to love others, no problem. Even if that love, as we read in 1 Corinthians, involves what? Suffering. Well, a better place than I deserve. The problem is, and this is true, guys, I want you to understand, the greatest amount, this is the greatest amount of work-related accidents is accredited to the experience. Familiarity breeds intent. Mm -hmm. You guys have heard that expression before, right? Matthew 18, verse 21 to 35 says this, And Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often, how often, how many times shall my brothers sin against me and I forgive them? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children, and that all he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii, and laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So this fellow servant fell down at his feet, and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servant saw what had been done, they were grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called them, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you have not also had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due. So my heavenly Father will also do to you if each, if each of you from his heart not forgive his brother his trespasses. Now, it's more than just about forgiveness. It's about recognizing that we were undeserving of God's grace as well. It, it's interesting, this story, we don't really understand it because it's given in a different currency, but basically there's this one servant and he owed millions of dollars. Millions! I mean, he was never going to be, in our currency, he was never going to be able to pay it back. Right? And the master showed grace. The debt was great and he was still able to show grace. But then one of the other servants, who only basically, he only owed a few bucks, right? He owes him a few bucks. He says, listen, he grabs him by his throat. How dare you? You owe me this money. You pay me now, right? We get upset. Somebody does us wrong, especially inside the body of Christ. You want to know better. You're a Christian. How dare you? How dare you say those things? How dare you do those things? And God's up in heaven. And I wonder if the angel... The Bible actually tells us the angels sit in and they view what we do. And they're like, can you believe Ryan right now? He's yelling. He's yelling at people after all that God's forgiven him of because they said something he didn't like. Can you believe it? He's getting upset with people right now because he because they did him wrong. God's saying, you wicked servant. I mean, shouldn't you be merciful of all? Those who are the beloved, shouldn't they be the most loving? Those who have been forgiven much, shouldn't they be showing the most mercy? Romans 1.21 says this, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but because they were taught their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. You know, it's nothing like a health scare that will bring you to a place where you realize how blessed you are. Realize how blessed you are. I've been married to my wife for 13 years now. 13 years. It seems like that's impressive. I, I pat myself on the back for that one. I pat her on the back more than anything. Right? 13 years you've been married. You know what we've been going through the last few weeks? Issues with her thyroid. We're not sure if it could be one disease or another disease. And then on top of that, 
we get told that they found something on our ovaries and that they thought it was cancer. And I'm like, man, God, I can't do this right now. Right? It's bad enough the thyroid thing. Now there's a possibility that she's got cancer too on top of it. And then I found myself start going through these mental gymnastics. You guys know what I'm talking about. What's life going to look like? Right? If my wife leaves this world, she goes up to heaven. I mean, God just got himself a really good worship leader, but I mean, <laughs> I, I need a worship, you know, so I'm, I'm going to miss her. And four kids in their homeschool, how am I going to do that? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. And, and just the thought of going to bed at night and not having her next to me. All these thoughts just start pouring and flooding into my head. And, and then all of a sudden I become very thankful. Baby, what can I do for you? Can I do anything? I'm always at, baby, can I? And I realize that after 13 years, you know what starts happening? You start just thinking that the person's always going to be there. Just take it for granted. And you ought not to. We just take God's mercy and God's love for granted. And we ought not to. Guys, we're drawn to a close here. So please stay with me. Verse 10 and 11. And this is the love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God's love, if you're taking note, demonstrates that he is sacrificial, but also that he desires that his love is duplicated in us. His love is duplicated in us. Guys, I want to point out one other thing. I was going through the book of Hosea this week. Hosea chapter 14, it's this great chapter on love, God's love for his people. And it's all about God sharing with the people. Listen, you've been unfaithful. You've been part of You've worshipped idols. You've worshipped false gods. Listen, you've done it wrong for too long. And he's telling them, now is the time to repent. And he promises them that there's going to be a time after the repentance where God restores to them everything. And he shows them his great love. And do you know how he does this? He does this through the prophet Hosea. He tells Hosea, listen, here's what I want you to do. You're going to show God's love and God's forgiveness and God's mercy by marrying a prostitute. What? I'm sorry, said, God, say that again? Yeah, I want you to marry a prostitute. That way the nation Israel sees what their unfaithfulness looks like, right? And then also gets to see God's love for them despite their unfaithfulness. One of my favorite verses in the scripture, I share it all the time, that he is faithful even when we are faithless because he cannot deny himself. And God says, I want the prophet. Now here's the interesting thing that I found about the prophet Isaiah. He's a contemporary of Isaiah. Now if I'm looking at the, 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 the straws, you know, who gets to draw what for prophecy? God, why, why did Isaiah? I mean, you got like 60 some odd chapters. You could you'd speak through them about the Messiah coming. I mean, you do some pretty impressive things through Isaiah, right? Why can't he marry the prostitute and I take it over his gig, right? Isn't that what we do? Ryan, you have no idea what it is that you're asking me to do in loving people, especially loving my enemies, because you have no idea who my enemies are. But God does. And God says, despite that, I still want you to be sacrificial. In fact, Jesus says, in John 13, 34 to 35, a new covenant I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I'm very selfish, guys. And the idea of loving people the way God wants me to love them is difficult. It's even difficult for me to love people the way God's called me to love them that are good to me. This past uh, Mother's Day, okay? I thought I did good, you know? I went out and I got my wife an air fryer and a steam mop. She goes, she goes, you got me that. Because you like when I cook for you and I clean your house. <laughs> I said, but baby, I did love you the way that you want to be loved. I made dinner. She goes, yes, you did. That was an act of service. And that is one of my love languages. Thank you very much. Right? And I realized something. I really did want the air fryer. I don't know <laughs> See, I like the way John ends it here. Because he says, beloved, if, you, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. It implies that we aren't, yeah. that we can still improve. Yeah. My brother 
He said, I got one younger brother, and I mess with him a little bit. You know, I'm five years older, so I get to pick on him just a little bit, right? And so we were up in Orlando, and I'm visiting with him, and I'm picking on him a lot of it, all right? All right? His wife is pregnant, and I'm making jokes that he looks more, all right? <laughs> Things like that, all right? And after the, this, after the time together, my wife, as we're driving home, says, Brian, you're kind of mean to your brother a little bit. You, yeah, you razz him, but you razz him a little too much. You're a little too hard on him, right? And I think for all of us here, if we're being honest, God is knocking on our hearts going, listen, you could do a little bit better in the area of love, in the area of sacrifice, in the area of recognizing that God has shown us great mercy and that we're undeserving of it. But you can do a little bit better in the arena of making sure that that Christian birthmark, if you will, is on display for all to see. It's still done in love still done in a way that God's saying, listen, I'm doing this not because I just want to give you a hard time, but because it's better for your relationships. I had the opportunity this past week, as I'm the head of, uh, I oversee a department in my company, and uh, my boss says, hey, listen, you're going to have to go pull this employee aside, and you're going to have to let them know you're, they're about to lose their job. And I want to do that, but, you know, this person's been messing up a lot, and I, I need to do that, right? So I sit down with this person, and I start going over all the things that they're doing wrong. This is why you're going to lose your job. You are going to lose your job. And I start, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty tough boss at times. And I start letting them know. This is, and I see the person start getting worked up. You know what I'm talking about? They're getting resistant. That wall's going up. Yeah, well, so-and-so does this, and so-and-so doesn't do their job. And, so, and why are you only ever talking to me? And, and there's a part of me that starts going. And then the person says to me, I don't care. And it's in that moment that the person says, I don't care. The light goes off. And I looked at this girl and I said, oh, you care. You care a lot. And I said, and furthermore, the reason why you're going to lose your job is because you're broken. And you are broken and you, listen, you're, you're at the work, the work, the life that you're living outside of work is starting to affect the work that you do here. But you're valuable. You're valuable to me. You're valuable to this company. And most importantly, you are valuable to God, and I watched this girl's eyes just well up with tears. Just well up. And I said, listen to me. I want you to walk worthy of the calling that God has placed on your life. I want you to give your life to the Lord. The only thing that's going to fix this situation where you would work is not by performing better. It's by loving God. Knowing that God loves you and loving Him in return. That's going to affect every other relationship that you have. You see, the key to this love isn't in them. It's in Him. It's in Him. My son Judah, one of the sweetest kids I know. And not just be, I don't say that because he's my kid. This kid has a compassion level that I am devoid of, okay? He loves. We were talking earlier this morning about different roles my kids. I see them having in ministry. Like Levi is the evangelist. He will talk your ear off <laughs> until you repent of your sins. Just <laughs> reality. He's going to do it. Zion is very thoughtful. I could see him pastoring. But Judah, at first I said, you know, he'd be a pastor. But then I realized that kid would go to like the slums of Kenya and India and just love on people that are the unloved, the untouched. He don't care. We were watching this movie, Wonder. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's Julia Roberts, this little boy that has face deformities, right? This little boy, he's talking about his school life and just the hardship that he's having. And during the movie, Judah is sobbing and crying that people are so mean to somebody just because of the way they look. And his heart's breaking. And I'm one of those broken-hearted little boys. It ought not to be. This kid will love people in a way that I only hope to be able to love people at some point. And I realize that the answer to that is because, or the answer for me loving people the way God's called me to love is to realize and to empathize. The reason why Judah loves the unlovable is because he himself struggles, if you guys know my son, with his words. He can't speak well. And so anytime somebody's broken, anytime somebody, he empathizes, he immediately relates to him and goes, I've been there. I know what it's like not to have friends. I know what it's like to be treated harshly. And he just loves. Christian, we were the unloved. Not one person on the face of this planet has ever deserved the mercy and love of God. And if that's not enough to move you to loving others, nothing will be.
absolutely not. <coughs> Spurgeon said this, Never let it be thought that any sinner is beyond the reach of divine mercy, so long as he is in the land of the living. I stand here to preach illimitable love, unbounded grace, to the vilest of the vile, to those who have nothing in them that can deserve consideration from God. Men who ought to be swept into the bottomless pit at once if justice meted out than their deserts. That's what God's called us to do. To love the way he loved us. Christian love ain't sappy love. It ain't weakness. It's the greatest of strengths. It is the product of the most transformed lives.